Okay. All right. Well, I think we've got everybody waiting. We're pretty much all here, I think. So we might start going. All right. Okay. All right. All ready to go. So good morning, everyone. Yeah, I'll start off with the intro, maybe. So, um, yeah. So, anyway, thanks everybody for joining us for the workshop on how to prepare for bushfires. So, we have James Chan and Jenny Scott from Council Sustainability Team, and Sam Tucker and Angus Lord from the RFS. So, they're going to take us through how to prepare your home for a bushfire, the bushfire season, what to do if a bushfire threatens your property, what's the history of the bushfires in Paringa, and so on. There'll be opportunities for questions, and you're welcome. Uh, so you'll be welcome to ask questions during the presentation, either sort of wave your hand or click on, and, and then you have to click on the unmute button, which you're probably all familiar with. Just lower left-hand corner of your screen, the microphone. And there'll be more time, so time for questions at the end of the presentation as well. So we'll start off with Jenny, I think. Is it? Yeah, thank you, Robin. Good morning, everyone. So morning. the topic is bushfire. Good time for it, just coming into summer. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is I'm going to ask a few questions and just see um, how many of you have answers to these questions that are all going to affect how well you might fare in a bushfire. So first of all, um, everybody live in Karinga? Yes? Yes. Yep. Okay. Next does... Uh, Anybody live close to bushland? Yes. Yeah? Most I live in the red zone. Right, okay. So you're in a very close I'm contact. I'm, I'm five houses from the bush. Okay, but still plenty close enough for embers to get to you? Uh, similarly, similarly, yes, about, uh, uh, about 100 metres from the bush, yes. 100 metres. But there are houses in between, you know. The... Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I live in a dead-end street which backs onto out of the lane of the, the National Park, the Coringa National Park, mm -hmm. in West Pimble, yes. Lynn, you need to go off mute. You can't go off mute. I'm off so, mute. No, no, you're not. Yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry, yeah. sorry. There we go. Right, okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm on Kissing Point Road on um, the, the hill slopes up. All the trees touch and I have a timber house. So we just have a a gateway straight up and right. twice the back the back um just behind us is gone when the bush fires when i bought my house i put my 10 percent on and dropped my kids off at the airport and thought i'll go and have a look what's happening because Karingai, all the all linfield everybody was burning at that stage that was about 72 or 74 and um i went there the house next to me was that evacuated um, and the little street round behind me, I went down there. The bush, all the houses, all the gardens had gone. They, they were putting out spot fires. And then the fire started again. So I'm racing up to the fire brigade. Boy, I'm thinking, I'm not even going to have a house. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm in the scary, scary. Right. Okay. Well, that was a very early lesson learned on that one. And then, and then in the next fires, again, and they told us 10 minutes to get out if it comes and, oh. Right, yeah. That's how it works. 10 minutes, sometimes you don't even get 10 minutes warning. No. So <laughs> this is the workshop for you, that's for sure. Yep. So um, how many of you live in a standalone house? Me. Yeah. I do, yes. Yep, pretty much most people. And would it be, well, we know Lynn's is timber, so it's highly vulnerable. How many people live in a brick and tile residence? I do. You do? Okay. They're also vulnerable to bushfires. Not yes. uh, quite as, as perhaps vulnerable as a timber residence, but still vulnerable. So if you have a brick and tile home, we'll talk about how embers get into that. Um, uh, who has pets? I say I'm <laughs> no pets. No pets? No pets. No? Okay. Not pets, are, pets are something, if you do have them, uh, that you might <laughs> want to include in your plan. And sometimes your neighbours, if they have pets and you're familiar with those pets, 
yeah, they might require some assistance in getting those pets out of there if they're not home. So being aware of pets and if there are ones around you and if people might call on you for help, how you might help them. Does everybody have their own transport? Yes. Yes. Yes? No. Okay. Yeah. No? One no? Okay, that's something to include in the planning as well as to uh, how you're going to get out and who you can call on, perhaps at very short notice. And that might be your neighbours. Talk to them about whether or not you can rely on them to help you get out. And, of course, always uh, neighbours either side of you. Don't just rely on one neighbour. Okay. Um, who has a bushfire survival plan? No. <laughs> no? Just leave. Just leave. Just leave. What, was the question, what was the question, Jenny? Who had? A bushfire survival plan. Nope. No. Nobody. Okay. Well, Not as such. We do hope after this you'll see the, the benefit of having a bushfire survival plan and we'll give you um, means to help you fill that kind of a plan in. Okay, so that's just a few things to for us to be aware of as we go into this planning <coughs> session and for you to think of when you actually do a plan. So now we might move over to Angus, who's going to take us through the fire history in Karingo. Yeah, Gary. Good morning, guys. Uh, my name's Angus from the Karingo Bush Fire Brigade, uh, located at North Warunga. Uh, I will share my screen with you. Uh, just bear with me one second. Now, hopefully this is all uh, coming through for you guys. Uh, what I've got loaded up here is uh, through my RFS portal is a overview of Karingai with the wildfire history for the past seven years highlighted. Um, now, what you'll notice uh, overall is the distinct lack of any uh, significant bushfire events being highlighted here. So if I go down to South Taramara, for instance, this is the only significant one we've had um, on record for the past seven years, which is, of course, the, the Canoon Road fire. Many of you would remember uh, oh, significant yeah. for its um, it's a retardant drop from one of our um, VLAT aircraft. Um, I could go back further than seven years. However, this application is, is a bit um, patchy when it comes to actually recording uh, that. But uh, of course, we all know that the 1994 fire season was the last uh, significant fire event for uh, Karingai in terms of overall scope. Uh, we had um, significant fire impact through Karingai Chase National Park and then also through uh, Lane Cove. Through Lane Cove. So I guess I guess the, the key message from me uh, in terms of wildfire history is that we haven't had a, a significant uh, bushfire event in the past seven years. Uh, and given the amount of properties in Karingai that back onto the bush, um, the Hornsby Karingai Rural Fire Service is expecting um, that we will have a significant bushfire event. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of when, not if. Um, and that's why these sessions are so uh, crucial, not just for you guys, but for us in uh, being able to <laughs> highlight um, what may happen. So that's my takeaway is that we haven't had anything significant in the past, uh, the past seven years apart from Canoon Road. Uh, anything else you want uh, from me, Jenny? Uh, no, I think that, that's a pretty good summary. Thank you, Angus. So what we'll do now is we'll have a look at this, um, this application that Council uh, has from the US. It's called the SIM table. And basically what the SIM table does, it allows us to show fires that potentially could happen in the future. And what we're going to do, we're going to run a fire in this instance across the north of, look, northern side of Karingai. And that north side of the Karingai, particularly around North Taramara, Warunga, et cetera, uh, where the suburbs uh, back onto the bushland, 
uh, very vulnerable to fire. That's equally in South Taramara and all along that southern border uh, of Karingai, and where we go into Lane Cove National Park. That's also highly vulnerable to fire. But we'll just show you the north side today. And um, it teaches you the same lessons that we would learn if we were um, on any location in Karingai. So James is going to bring up the map of Karingai. That's an aerial photograph. And if anyone has any questions, just, just ask away at any time. So I, we have I just, there. Yes. I just wonder if we, I actually came from um, the far south coast and a lot of my relatives and friends were burnt out in these uh, this previous big bushfires, Christmas before, or New Year before last. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a good idea to collect the history over 50, 70 years while there's still people alive to tell the tale mm -hmm. and tell you where. Because um, I was a child in the 1952 bushfires that went into that area and it was a wind change that uh, saved some of those villages, but they were horrific fires. And um, I mean, I know that my block was burnt to the ground in 19, in somewhere in the mid fifties here, because mm -hmm. the elderly couple who are now deceased, who lived behind me, had both these blocks when the land was opened up after the war. And they knew the patterns of the fires coming through these gullies. And I think it's, short-sighted to just look at fires in the last decade or whatever because um you know look at Cabago, look at Cooma, those little villages down there um i grew up with people who died in those and i have cousins who lost everything who had not a gum tree in their house paddock and i think that we should be uh, keeping the I think we should look much longer term in keeping our records because that same bush and those same channels of fire, those northwest winds, go along those same valleys. Yes, look, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, Council has done a project um, with the Risk Frontiers Group at Macquarie University on exactly that, the fire history in Kalinga. <laughs> And it's surprising uh, that prior to really 2000, not a lot of records were kept. And the only way Risk Frontiers could find detail on the fires that had happened previously were from accounts in local newspapers about where the fire was, the number of houses lost, etc. And uh -huh. a lot of that local knowledge um, at least in terms of councils, uh, would love to have. Um, and certainly, I, I'm sure a lot of the older RFS brigade members are uh, in the same in the same boat. Uh, I'm just wondering if um, Sam or Angus might comment on that. Uh, the the records. That... Sorry, Angus, you go ahead. No, no, you go. You go for it, Sam. What I was going to say was the the um, mapping that Angus showed you today is what we have digitally um, recorded through the service. At our station, we actually have a record of all fires since um, Karingai Brigade was actually initiated, and when some was of them that? are hand drawn hand drawn maps. Um, what is it? Fifty seven. Yeah, However, yeah. yeah, so we we actually do have records of all the fires. Some of them aren't as um, technologically beautiful as the one Angus showed you, but um, we have uh -huh. members that have been members for 50 years. Uh -huh. Well, when, I wonder if we could take the records back to when the lands were opened up, like this land here was opened up for house blocks after the Second World War. And so there are still some very old people around 
who have the knowledge. And uh, I'm not sure that you've po possibly tapped into that because you might not they mightn't have known to, how to share. If, if I could just add on to what um, Sam said previously, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely, I agree that um, we, we do need to go further back than the last uh, decade. I guess my reason for showing you the last seven years is the, the fact that that data is the most the most accurate. Um, mm -hmm. If I were to go mm -hmm. back further than further than seven years, um, we still do have a lot of a lot of data on that in the in the system that I can. Uh, show and, and show you all. Uh, however, it's not, um, not as accurate. There are some large fires which we, we of course know about as the RFS, but aren't integrated into my system. So I guess that's the reason for, yes. for the way I showed and you that. But I don't mean I to, it's not a criticism uh, of you, Angus. It's just that I just wonder if we can retrieve this information uh, back to when these you know, residences were started uh, before much more time goes by. Okay. Laura, uh, I wonder if we can, if, yeah, if, if we could link Macquarie Uni study up to uh, residents, we might try and do that through council. Mm -hmm. So that'd be good. Anyway, thanks. Thanks, Beverly. Uh, okay. So, Sam, did you want to say something? No, that, that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. All right, so what we're doing here is in purposes for training for the future, we know that fires um, have certain corridors, et cetera, that they like to follow, but they can be, because of the vagaries of the weather, entirely random to predict. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at is that north side of uh, Kuringai, and this model that we're looking at is a model that has built into it a fire behaviour model. It also has uh, the, all the different weather variabilities, the wind speed, the humidity, the temperature, etc. And it also has Karingai's uh, vegetation map down there and uh, the terrain. So this model reflects the way fire behaves in this type of vegetation and in this type of terrain. And also we can, if you see that blue circle up in the corner, vary the wind speed and direction. So what we're doing is we run a hypothetical and we say it's a Tuesday, sometime in the future. Think about what you are doing on a Tuesday generally. And it's a forecast to be a catastrophic fire day in this our hypothetical planning scenario. And it's going to be very hot, very windy. Now, you know that already the day before from the forecast. So think about what it is the day before that you might be doing to keep yourselves safe the next day. And what a lot of people were advised to do when the catastrophic fire uh, warning went out two years ago was uh, they went somewhere for the day where it was safe. They left home if they were in a highly vulnerable situation. So the safest option for you is to go somewhere safe, somewhere where you're not at risk. So what we look at here is uh, we're going to start a fire, a simulated fire, of course. Now, this fire <laughs> behaviour model allows us to see how the fire travels across the landscape under the various wind and weather conditions. So it's 35 degrees, it's very dry, very low humidity. So James is going to show us a fire that might start, let's say, uh, up somewhere near the Pacific Highway. And uh, because it's a northwesterly wind and it's blowing fairly well, it's early in the morning, so we'll say that already the wind is getting up around 20, 30 kilometres. So the fire has ignited. Let's say it was a fallen power line or it might have been a traffic accident. Uh, could have been a lightning strike from the night before. So, uh, Sam, I don't know if you're talking about this or, or Adam is, but what would RFS be doing at this point? Thanks, thanks Jenny. I'll, I'll leave this one for Angus. Right, Angus, hey, Adam, Angus, sorry. So, so on the catastrophic <laughs> same, same. fire day, uh, the rural fire service would uh, in all likelihood be standing up uh, all of their available 
uh, bushfire tankers. So that would mean either um, crews uh, already prepared on a pager uh, to ready to go, or more likely um, we would have all of our crews at stations ready to go um, as soon as something like this was to happen. Um, we would also have, if the winds uh, were kind to us, we would have our aviation assets um, stood up and ready to go, such as our, our large bombers and uh, our helicopter bucketing machines. Um, keep in mind, though, that we may not be in this area as, as a service fully equipped because we may have other fires to deal with in neighbouring districts. So if the Northern Beaches has a similar fire um, start earlier, we may have resources directed over there. Um, our doctrine is, of course, to go where the fires are not where the fires may be. So if they call us in, um, we go, we may leave some resources, uh, we, we would leave some resources in the district for local uh, response. But um, when this fire starts, our crews would be paged and uh, the local brigades would be responding. Uh, on, a, on a day like this, on a catastrophic day, we would be sending a minimum of, um, of five, five tankers uh, to this incident. Hey, thanks, Angus. All right, so we know what RFS is doing. Also at this point, National Parks would be deploying their firefighting team. The police and the SES would be on alert and they would already be considering uh, what it is they need to do. They would be liaising with the RFS headquarters who have a fire planning department and they would be already forecasting where this fire is going to travel and roughly how fast. And that's how they base their messaging. Uh, when they put their messaging out for a watch and act, for example, it's based on the modeling that they do to say where this fire might go and how quickly it might travel. So we know now that this fire is taking a good strong hold. It has already progressed to quite a sizable fire. So we're a couple of hours into this event and as you know, on a hot summer's day, as the uh, wind picks up during the uh, middle of the day and it gets to its hottest, these fires can start to really get going and behave in very unpredictable ways. So we'll get James to increase the wind speed. It's now going up to about 60 kilometres an hour. So it's blowing fairly hard. It's coming from the northwest. And every time that fire gets to the top of a ridge, it tends to send out the embers. And because Karingai National Park is full of gullies and um, steep slopes, this potential for embers to travel quite a distance is, uh, is there in this landscape. So we can see now that some spot fires have spotted well ahead of the fire front itself. And so this is how these fires tend to take on these almost unpredictable characteristics, which can make the forecast modeling quite difficult. So whilst you're tuned to the radio and the television, and we know it's 702 ABC is the local uh, emergency broadcaster, so you would also have fires in the me app on your phone and be monitoring those for what's happening. But you can see things can change very quickly. So let's just say what happens now that these fires are advancing fairly fast. They're starting to get close to built up areas. So Angus, what's happening now with our effects? Thanks, Jenny. Um, with the fire conditions, uh, as you've simulated here, I would expect this fire to be uh, at an emergency warning level uh, for the North Taramara area uh, and the North Warunga area. Um, given the location of these fires at the moment, and on a catastrophic day, we would almost certainly not be sending crews um, down fire trails for their safety. Um, we would be relying on um, our water bombing aircraft to suppress uh, the head of these fires. And our crews would be deploying along the properties um, which are going to be uh, first hit for property protection. Um, in these conditions, 
I would again say that it would be unlikely that we would be conducting any kind of back burning operations. It would be uh, evacuation and property protection. So the protection of life is our first priority, um, firefighting life and uh, of course, uh, civilian life. So we would be going straight into property protection, uh, setting up for that in the North Taramara and North Warunga areas. Um, given the conditions, uh, this will almost certainly be impacting houses and we uh, have minimal chance of being able to um, <coughs> stop this or slow this um, in the bush, given um, we're basically not going in there, given these conditions. Right, thanks Angus. So I want you to think about what you'd be doing then. Okay, this fire is really taking a hold. It's looking like it might be a major fire. So we will be going into the planning tool, Climate Wise Community, shortly. We'll just let this fire run for the day and see where it goes, because this is the type of fire we want you to plan for. Something that's moving fast, something that's quite unpredictable in the where it ends up, and something that you may get little warning for. Jenny, can I just ask, uh, can, can you run through how to get onto the RFS fires near me? I, I don't have the app, I just go on um, uh, through um, Google, I suppose. Do you want to do that for people? I don't know. Well, does everybody have that already? Is yeah. everybody familiar with that one? Okay, uh, Angus or Sam? Fires near me, yeah. So the, um, the fires near me, yeah. Yeah, so the thanks Sam. So the Fires Near Me app is available um, on any on any smartphone. Uh, the big advantage we have uh, with Fires Near Me is not only can you um, log in on any any uh, particular time and see what fires are currently in your area, uh, you can actually set a watch zone. Um, you can make this from anywhere from five kilometres to um, I think up to about 15, 15 20 kilometres would be the most you'd want to go. Um, and this will send you a notification every time a, a fire starts in your area, a fire changes in your area, or uh, most importantly, when a fire increases um, an alert level status. So uh, I can't share it with you at the moment, but I have a, I have a rather large zone and I can see that there is an advice fire at uh, Fiddletown Creek. Um, and my phone will send me an alert every time uh, the boundaries of that fire change or if it was to go from advice to watch and act or straight into uh, emergency warning. So, um, so is, that, is that only from where your home is or like say I was in Vega for Christmas, uh, would mm -hmm. that tell me where the fires were within a range of that? Oh, absolutely. So that's a great question. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the watch thing that you're talking about, set up the watch yeah. zone. No, fantastic question. So uh, you can actually set up uh, up to 10 uh, watch zones on yep. the app. Oh, so um, mm -hmm. a lot of our members have uh, a watch zone set up at their house in Karingai, and they may have it set up in their family's place out west, or like you were saying, down, down south in Vega, you yep. can um, have as many up to 10 and you can have them in variable size so not only can you be looking out for yourself but um, maybe friends and relatives mm -hmm. so you can jump on it as well thanks yeah so even even without the app you can just log in through google and get in whatever information you do you just look at you just scroll around the map i guess absolutely so, it's, it's yeah. the same it's the same information um I'll, you just i would know. i would advise the app just because you get yeah. that notification it's it's um yeah it gets sent as soon as um, we have it. And it's, and it's actually really surprisingly fast, um, maybe not surprisingly, but um, the information is put on fires near me almost as quickly as we, as the RFS receive it. So we will be getting to station and responding um, with our lots of sirens to the call and we can log on and see that it's already on the app even before um, crews may have gotten yeah. to the location. Okay. Thanks for that, Angus. So you can see now, if you look at the fire, uh, it has spotted ahead again. So um, you've got it spreading very rapidly. You can see at times the fire front, which is the bright yellow part, starts to take a sudden run, go very fast. And that's because it's going up a slope. Okay, now this isn't real time, by the way. We've speeded it up because we don't want to sit here all day for the fire. 
So we're running it at 128 times faster than it would happen in real life. So thankfully. Now the, the, thankfully, yes. Now the wind is picking up, it's really roaring, it's gusting up to 90 kilometres an hour. And that's getting to a, a wind speed where it makes it very difficult, even for the aerial appliances, to get in there and, and dump the water on the piles. So we're looking at a situation, particularly if there are other fires burning in the area, that there may not, and there almost certainly will not in most cases, be a fire there to defend your particular property. No. So it, I don't know whether you can, Jenny, sorry, our, yes. fire station, our fire station is about to go as well. Right. So. On the map. <laughs> so that's great. <laughs> right, so the fire station's on the map as well, going to get burned. So what we're looking at there in this situation is that um, you're on your own. Let's plan for being on our own. With luck, you might not be, but plan for it. That way you'll know how to deal with it. Okay, best option, not to be there. And uh, of course, if you haven't got transport, you would have been long gone out of there. Got a, if you had to, a, a taxi to take you out that morning. And, uh, and the house, we're going to show you how the house can be all nicely prepared so that when you come back, you know, there's a good chance that that fire uh, might have left your house intact. So what we're going to do now, we're going to shift our attention away from this, this terrible scenario that's happened up on the north side. And we're going to have a look at the planning side of things. How do we deal with a fire like this? So we don't just leave you hanging in there telling you it's a big problem. We give you a means to do something about it. Now, this is a, a, a council uh, website called Climate Wise Communities. It's something that's been developed over the last few years. It has been tried and tested in very many ways and uh, has uh, stood the test of time. And so we can uh, quite confidently say to you that working your way through this process, you should end up being fairly well, not very well prepared for a fire. So what it does first is it, it allows you to um, check in and just go ready to check in. And it gives you a little bit of information. And there's five steps there. And the first step is a really important one because apart from saying you won't sue council if uh, things go horribly wrong, it is about mapping your own property and looking at the risks that your own property is exposed to. So let's, anybody want to volunteer an address for us to type into this? 97 like Kissing Point Road, Taramara. 97 <laughs> Kissing Point Road, Taramara. Okay. Let's and I'm terrified. <laughs> yes. Uh, it's uh, true of a lot of people in Karinga. So we go to, as we look at your property in particular. That's down here, isn't it? Yeah, down there, that green one. Yeah. So we'll outline, it's just loading up the, the detail. Okay, now it shows your property and it all show, so shows you as the colour slowly fills in what risks your property is exposed to. So if we scroll down, there'll be a little table at the bottom. You've got 197 on 97. Ah, it's 97, Jane. 97, yeah. 97 on further up. Okay, well, let's have a look. Not, not 197. Yeah, 97 Kissing Point Road, that's it. Yeah, and there's the bush. <laughs> there's the bush. <laughs> so the area in red is the bushfire um, hazard zone, flood, it's the area that's closest to the bush. 
and the yellow, there is a K down there, isn't there, James? Just more for us to read, I'm afraid. Can't, uh, I can't see it. No, that's the trouble with teeny tiny little screens. Any way to make the screen bigger, James? On your individual phones, you can sort of enlarge yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Then, sure. then it goes behind Jenny. Oh, I see. Okay. So bushfire hazard zone is the red, bushfire prone land. The yellow part is everywhere that has flame contact and yes. radiant heat are issues. <laughs> so they're the uh, you're right on the edge of that, but that's still what you would plan for. Twice that valley's gone. Yeah, I'm so, I so you can see that blue hatched area there. That's an area that's um, got restricted development restrictions on it uh, because it's it access is one road in, one road out. But you're not in that hatched area, Lynn. So no, I'm uh, on Kissing you... Point Road, which is a car park. Yeah, well, more than likely, the police wouldn't be allowing cars down there long before. Yeah. The the in South Taramo, if Kominara is burning, the only way out for all of us is Kissing Point Road and Pacific Highway. Yes. There's no other out if Kominara is blocked. Yep. And that's something you need to factor into your planning, even a bigger reason for you not to be there any time the fire is close. Okay, so a little table at the bottom will show you what it is that your property is vulnerable to. So we just scroll down the page and there are the hazards that you might have to think about when you're doing a uh, plan. Now, we don't just plan for bushfire, we also include storm and heat wave as well because they are um, very important. More lives are lost through heat wave than through either bushfire or storm. So we do need to include that in our planning. Now you may just want to start with a bushfire plan, but I do encourage you to look at those other risks as well, because sometimes something that you can do to make yourself more resilient to bushfire will also help you be more resilient to heat waves and, uh, and storms, etc. So once you've done that step, you can save it to a PDF on your computer and keep it. All this information is only for you to keep. Council doesn't keep any of that information. So you know what risks you need to plan for. So we'll move on to the second step, which is about looking at your personal situation. And we did some work with the RMIT and the Bushfire CRC. And when they looked at people who had bushfire survival plans in Black Saturday, they found that the, their plans almost universally failed. And the reason was the fire didn't happen the way they thought it was going to happen. Mm. And they only had one situation that they planned for. So the important thing here is to be able to adapt quickly and change mm. your plan if you need. So we build that into that lesson into what we do. So this is about learning how resilient you might be. And this is both not only to the bushfire, but of course to, to other um, stresses, especially related to extreme weather, how uh, resilient you are and um, how you might factor that into your plan. So it's just a series of questions with tick the box answers. And each one of these questions has a little um, tip on why it's important to plan. So let's say you live alone. I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we tip on that. Done. Yes. Tick it down. So when you live alone, it asks you in your plan to consider whether you will need help or whether others might call on you for help. So that's something right up front in the plan to think, well, I might need to do this planning exercise 
with people that I know I'm going to have to rely on. Whether they live in the area or out of the area, it's a good idea to share your plan with other people. Okay, so the people in your household, or if you live alone, you don't have any of them, but you may have other people in your household uh, who will need to consider their needs as well in your bushfire plan. So if they have special needs, for example, medication uh, needs, or you do, and those medications are susceptible to heat, so you look at the medication, it says it needs to be stored below a certain temperature. Then you're going to have to factor that into your plan. How are you going to keep that oh product cool when you leave? Yeah, well, I have diabetic needles, so. Right. Mm. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, well, that's a, a no. I mean, it might be that you are. That's slightly important. <laughs> that's right. That's very important. So those sorts of things are, are very important in the planning. Um, if you're a carer and living with people who have the other needs, whether they're medical or psychological needs, you know, they might not cope well under stress. They're things you take into account. And Sam and Angus, jump in whenever you feel you want to add something. Um, pets in the household, we've kind of touched on that. And... Uh, that's a really important one because many people have been in the situation where they haven't been able to get home to rescue their pets. And it's been a source of never ending distress for them afterwards. Mm. Um, and also they often call on people who still might be in the area to assist in getting their pets out. And whether or not you have your own transport, we touched on, that's so important to make a provision for someone who's able to get you out if you have don't have your own transport, any time of the day or night, it might be 2 a.m. in the morning that you need to leave. Mm -hmm. So you can't think that the RFS or someone else is going to rescue you because they just may not be able to. Mm -hmm. There may not be those resources. So you need to think of how you'll be able to get out. If your uh, neighbours or, or you are from a non-English speaking background, think about how the messaging and how you can communicate with those people if you do need assistance, or perhaps you might let them know uh, what's going on if, if they're a little bit um, unable to interpret the situation for themselves. So as we scroll down, James, are you still awake? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we're There's looking at a bit of delay between me doing something and the actual. Um, is there? Oh, so you are away. Okay. Yes. He has a small <laughs> baby in the house, so he's allowed to fall asleep. So the situation when you have your own home, there are modifications you can make to your house, of course, to to make it more resilient. But if you're a renter, then there may be negotiations to be had with the landlord in that particular respect. And if you get no joy, then you've just got to realise, um, you know, you need to be very well prepared to get out and take with you what you will want to keep if your landlord isn't coming to the party. Our phone connections. So we know that in these fires, communications can go down quite quickly. And uh, landlines mean that, um, if there's no landline communication, then the likelihood is you'll have no internet communication. A mobile phone might be your only option. And if the mobile phone towers go down, which they burn, then you're not going to mm -hmm. get any information that way. Oh my so goodness. you don't get your, your fires near me at information. What about water? Because... When we had the South Tarahara one, the one that that idiot lit, sorry, I'll just turn that off. Um, um, the the hairdresser just up the road, she was in the middle of doing people's hair and the water stopped because the fire brigade were using the water. Mm. And that was in, you know, South Tarahara, the hairdresser around here. South Tarahara shops. And all the ladies are there with their hair all in stuff and couldn't rinse their hair. 
So Angus, do you want to discuss that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so the first thing that will probably happen is, uh, yeah, so that, that water pressure will, will go. Um, the RFS and uh, subsequently fire and rescue um, will be straight in there. And the, one of the first things we do uh, on scene is obviously um, securing our water source and that will, the mains pressure will, uh, will drop away. Um, a handy thing for us as firefighters to know is where we can access uh, what we call a static water source. So whether that be a dam or a pool. So we offer um, static water source signs um, to be put out the front of uh, your properties. Um, and they allow us to know where we can access um, these water sources if the mains pressure fails. So I've got that on mine. I've got a pool and I've got that sign out the front of my house too. Yeah. Fantastic. So what we would do in the event of uh, loss of pressure, if we have multiple um, fire trucks hooked up to the same um, the same town water line, is we would um, most likely come to the rear of your property and start using one mm -hmm. of our portable pumps to supply our our engines. Um, but in terms of your personal water supply, yeah, those static water sources are, are a great way not only for us um, but for you, um, and if a fire is in your area and you know and you understand from the messaging that you may be impacted, mm -hmm. things like um, things like filling the bath are a great way to it's a, it's, a, it's a small thing, but it's a thing that you can you can secure that water supply in your house for whatever use you may need, whether it's oh. um, small you know spot fires around the house if we're not there uh, or just water um, for you to have if those um, town supplies do uh, go down. Yeah, probably important to note there it is not a good idea to fill the bath and get in it and stay in your house and think <laughs> that's a good place to shelter. Absolutely. Quite a few people have died that way. So if you are stuck in your house when the fire hits, you need to think about being in a room where you can see what's happening outside and that has uh, uh, an exit both to the exterior and to the interior because you will want to put out any spot fires that might occur inside but you also want to be able to see outside because as soon as the fire fronts pass you want to go out of the building because there is a fairly good chance that your roof cavity may be on fire. And the first you'll know about it inside is when the roof caves in on you. Yeah, not a good place to be. So people who get in their bathrooms find they can't get out because there's no exterior door. So no. think about that. Uh, if you are going to shelter in place or you're forced to shelter in place, and hopefully that never happens, that you will have an idea of which room to shelter in. Um, did I forget anything, Angus? No. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, Jenny. The only other thing I would add is um, if you are certain of the direction the fire front is coming at you, ideally you would be sheltering in a room on the opposite side to um, allow the house to absorb all that or that radiant heat. And um, it may be a balancing act between doing that and being in a, a position where you can see what's going on. Okay, so that's the personal situation. So we've tried to tell you how each one of those aspects uh, is important to your plan when you do it. So the next aspect is to look at your property and get an understanding of just how vulnerable the property might be to bushfire or in fact what strengths it has. Now if your property turns out to be highly vulnerable that's another good reason not to be there yep. and also to make sure you have very good insurance. So what a lot of people do at the very start of this step is they draw a little map of their their property and they note different things on the property that, that might be a way for fire to get into the property. Underneath might, that. 
feed the fly. Yep, yep, underneath the house as well. And um, different features of the property that make it vulnerable. And again, there are also things that make it uh, uh, stronger, like having a pool as a water resource, or if you have a dedicated firefighting water tank on your property, that's something that the RFS can utilise for firefighting, or indeed, if there is someone there looking after your house, they can utilise for fire, fighting purposes. Uh, so you do that little little map and then we go and we go through every aspect of your property and look at it for how vulnerable it might be to fire. So in this case, we, we're looking at bushfire. So we press the bushfire button and you can see here there is a colour coding <laughs> going from red through to green. So if the design feature or what is listed below is red, it means that's a vulnerability for your property. If it's green or blue, it means it's more resilient. It's more of a strength. So when you're drilling down into what do I need to fix up about my property to make it more resilient, this will give you an idea. Because ideally, when you've left your property, in a way that it's likely to survive a fire, you can go back and it'll still be intact. And um, if people were planning to stay and defend, they go through this step. And if they have lots of red squares, then staying and defending is probably a suicide mission. Yeah. So it's very wise to, uh, to try and address those those red squares. So we go through the design of the roof, the materials of the roof. Uh, we look at whether you've got skylights or roof ventilators, the eaves and the fascia boards, the vent weep holes. And every time you tick on a box, it will uh, show you again, what it is that's a, a, a risk about that, that particular aspect. Now you can see at the bottom of each one there's a button that says further information and that takes you away from this site to a source of further information if you want to know why that particular aspect is uh, not so good. So we'll just go in, we'll just, there's a one that says Ember Guard. So would, can we just in, make that a little larger, James, please? What about your chimney? I mean, obviously that's open. What? Yeah, yeah, we look at chimneys. So, so the chimney just goes up. Yep, yeah, well, back to the one you're on there. So looking at the, the chimneys and the skylights and there it is. Yep. So open holes or broken vents or an open chimney top. So if your chimney top is not sealed and if it, you use it, then presumably it isn't sealed. I do use it. Okay, then perhaps you can put uh, around the chimney top itself uh, some ember-proof netting. Okay. So yeah. that way... I hadn't thought of chimney. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, the, the <laughs> embers can get out of the chimney, but they can also get in. Yes. Okay. The other point is you can block the chimney up um, at its point of entry into the house. So you can seal it up there just temporarily. Mm -hmm. So whatever embers come down the chimney stay in the fireplace. Okay. Okay. Oh, gosh. Yes, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Lots to think about. Mm. So we'll scroll on down. Um, anywhere where there's uh, air can get in or out is where embers can get in or out. And you'd be surprised how small a gap an ember can get in. Yeah. And part of the problem is that um, as the fire front approaches, the external temperature around your house goes up much faster than the internal temperature. And it creates a bit of a vacuum inside and actually sucks the hot air in oh. as the fire front approaches. And it brings with it the embers. So your house actually sucks the embers in. 
I think I'll be leaving. Yes. <laughs> That's most people go for that. Good. Good idea. <laughs> and so sealing your house up so that it's got no air gaps uh, is not only important for stopping embers, but also if you're trying to maximise the efficiency of heating and cooling yes, your home, yes. then that's another plus. Mm. So we go through uh, more aspects of the house. We look at the windows and the frames and uh, all the external doors and windows and what it is about them that makes them either a strength or a weakness. And I've seen uh, houses in the 1925s, uh, summer of 1920, that had flame licking at the back walls it had melted their um, air conditioning unit, but they had glazed window glass and it didn't break the glass. And they were mm. aluminium framed. And so that far, it was amazing this house wasn't burnt down. Um, in the end, they had to demolish the house for reasons because of the heat had affected the uh, steel frame, but it didn't get any flame inside. So. Uh, that was that an was interesting a lesson for me to see how useful that glazing is. So we look at the timber frames, etc. We look at garage doors because garage doors people don't <laughs> think about, but they're quite porous around garage doors. Lots of air flows in and out. The floor and the subfloor pl place space. Uh, particularly if you tend to, as uh, my family has done for generations, stored stuff under the house. Yep. Okay, mm. so mm -hmm. there's a, a lot that can burn under there in my place, and we have progressively over the years uh, removed most of it. So particularly if you're on stumps with an elevated floor, not so bad if you've got a slab because you can't really put anything under a slab. And we scroll on down, just quickly going through the remaining ones because I'm conscious of time. We look at all the outdoor features around the landscaping as well and, and what things in your landscaped features. For example, do you bring mulch right up to your walls? Is your garden right up to you? And that means you've got flammable material right next to your house. So people who may have bark mulch, for example, right up to their walls, have replaced it with a pebble mulch. Well, it's not a mulch, it's a surface. So, but it's not flammable is the point. So replacing anything that's flammable with a non-flammable surface. So going on down, you can get plants that are actually a little bit uh, less likely to burn than other plants. And there is information about those kinds of plants uh, in one of the links further below. So we keep scrolling down to the bottom, looking at fences and gates and gas bottles if you have them on barbecues, putting them somewhere safe. Or if you have the big gas uh, tanks at your, against your wall, about turning them around so the vent faces out away from the house. And they're mostly installed that way anyway. But that just means when those gas bottles heat up, they will naturally vent the gas. They won't blow up. And as they do, of course, that gas ignites. So you'll get a, a flame thrown maybe 10 metres across. And uh, if it's facing away from the house, then it's not going to set the house on fire. And then a lot of a few other aspects like pet enclosures and uh, uh, other features around your house that may be doormats, for example, great source of a fire starting. Anything you leave on your deck or veranda that can burn is a, where your fire, ignite the fire that can burn your house. So knowing your bushfire attack level, now if you live very close to the bush, that's something that may be of use to you. 
because if your house burns down, when you rebuild, if you rebuild, you will be required to build to whatever the attack level of your property is. So if you know that, you can plan for it in your insurance costs because it can cost uh, quite a bit more these days to build to those higher levels than just to put a rebuild back to where it was. Okay, so that's the property section. And again, you save it to a PDF and you've got it there to complete your plan. And we give you links at the very end to the RFSs, Bushfire Survival Plan. And that's the framework for you to work with. And you can use all this information to populate that plan. And the next step, step four, is all about your neighbourhood and getting to know those people around you and also who you might communicate with in a crisis. And what we do encourage people to do is to talk to your neighbours and see if you can get a few of them engaged in the idea of working together so that you might all work cooperatively if, for example, some people are away on holidays, then the neighbours will know um, this is their bushfire plan. We need to take their furniture off their deck or we need to uh, alert a family member that there is a fire coming. So there might be a whole different ways you can cooperate with other people. Again, a little mum map, just drawing the people that are your neighbours and the people you know you might be able to call on for help. And those who don't live close by, but still uh, you want to be part of your resource group. So they might be your backup. So if your neighbour can't take you, um, can't evacuate you, there may be somebody else who can come in and get you on it. So always having that plan B, maybe even plan C. Plan A, of course, is to, to leave. So again, just a series of questions about how well you know your neighbour, do you have the contact details? Have you discussed the planning with them? Uh, what their needs might be, for example, uh, we've spoken to people who were all ready to leave. The fire was um, coming. Their fire plan was all in place. It was all proceeding. And then their neighbour comes across uh, in a great panic and asks for help because her young son had dropped a pot plant on his foot and cut his big toe off. And they needed to get into hospital and she needed somebody else to take her other two children. So wow. those situations just happen. You know, it can be very hard to plan for, but you need to be able to cope with those kinds of contingencies if they happen. So we go through that personal one, uh, that neighbourhood one and all your communication network. And again, you get to the end of this section. We won't go through it too quickly because we're running out of time. And, uh, and that way you can incorporate those aspects into your plan. So the final step that we do is we provide a tool that people can use to test their plan. And what it does is it allows people to, uh, to check, to see if they've thought of a lot of things that very commonly happen. Is that step five, is it? Big pardon? Is that step five? If that's after step five, step oh. five is actually the links to all the plans. Oh, okay, okay. okay. Yes, sorry. Um, but before I just do this, I want to know, uh, Angus, um, any messaging that RFS would like to, to get across and reinforce leading into this summer? Thanks, Jenny. Um, really well put together. Uh, this, this tool is fantastic. I, I think the message from me is, um, and I think Sam can elaborate uh, on this as well, but the fire danger ratings um, that are released each day, um, I think they 
obviously the, the wording is quite intense, but knowing what they mean. So when we say catastrophic, what do we mean? It's not just uh, the fire conditions that we uh, may be facing on the day. It's what, what it means for, for you guys and your houses. So for example, on a catastrophic day, um, no, no property is built to be able to withstand fire on a catastrophic day. Um, and so for your survival, um, leaving early is the, is really the only, the only option in terms of um, your, your, your lives and your, the defense of your property. Um, and then going down to, you know, even the extreme and severe levels, which are below that, mm -hmm. um, it's about only properties that are specifically built or um, heavily prepared may be able to withstand um, bushfire. So that's my, that'd be my key message for, um, this fire season, that and um, and obviously downloading uh, fires near me and, and keeping up to date. Um, Karingo, I have a, a Facebook page where we'll be po we, we post um, general notifications about uh, hazard reductions and um, if we're doing large operations. Um, we we don't post generally during incidents because we're quite busy and we leave that to the official channels. Um, but that's always a place you can always. Um, <clears throat> message us for information as well. Um, Sam, do you have anything else from us? One thing I would like to add is at the South Taramara fire, it went from advice to emergency warning shelter in place within several minutes. Mm. Luckily for Karingai, um, because it was a catastrophic day, we had a large um, collection of resources from both police, fire and rescue and the RFS that were available to um, deal with that fire within 15 minutes, which was great for the community. But it's just one thing to remember on a catastrophic day, you may not get the warning to be able to leave early. It really is better to have your home prepared and to leave that morning and have plans in place for your pets, for your family, because it's very likely when we go back to whatever they're going to call it, COVID normal, and members of your immediate community, they may be working in the city and the children very likely will, will need somewhere to go home to at three o'clock in the afternoon when the fire is impacting. Um, and I think having a trigger point, particularly if you are impacted by uh, the need for medication or your health or exit strategies because you aren't able to drive somewhere. Uh, leaving that morning is the safest thing for everybody, including us. It, it enables us to protect your property and not just your life and your property because it, it puts a, a big burden on the resources that we may or may not have to protect you. All right, okay. Thanks for that, Sam and Angus. Okay, so what we're going to look at is the very last tool, is the what if tool. Now again, this was uh, designed by RMIT based on what they found from Black Saturday. And it is true not only of Black Saturday, but many fires before and since, these same issues have come up again and again. And James, can you just make it slightly larger? <clears throat> Uh, so that the wheel fits in the page, but you can see it a little better. Okay. All right, that'll do. So what we do is, this is like, the way RMIT designed it was as a, a pack of cards and you just pick the card out of the pack. Uh, we, we obviously couldn't do that on the internet. So what we've done is created a good old chocolate wheel, you all remember. And uh, we can spin it. So we spin the wheel and it will randomly stop on one of these, these issues that have been a problem for people with uh, bushfires. So there's no warning. So incorporate into your plan the, the contingency for there being no warning. So how would you cope if all of a sudden the fire's on your doorstep? It's in the middle of the night, you didn't hear the phone go off or the phone didn't go off. Um, you weren't, of course, listening to the radio. Uh, you weren't to know the fire had moved so fast, so quickly. And this happened 
Normally at night, fires die down, but in that uh, last big summer uh, fire, mm. the fires travelled overnight almost as fast as they did during the day. So as a consequence, a lot of people <coughs> were woken up in the middle of the night and told, you know, there's a fire just outside the door. What are you going to do? So you need to have, be ready for that. So we'll just do another one. We'll see what uh, another warning, another contingency comes up. <coughs> what would you do if... Embers and heat trap your escape. So you might have had to shelter in the house and the embers outside and the heat outside is just too much for you to be able to get out to go to your car. And of course, you wouldn't be going to your car at that point because you would almost certainly die. So leaving late is the most common reason why people die. So, number one, we do everything we can to avoid that situation. But if that situation did happen, what are you going to do? How are you going to cope? And that's where we looked at, well, what do you do? Where do you shelter in place? What water will you need inside? You know, putting, sealing the doors, the under the doors with wet towels around the windows. Uh, having a uh, water placed around the house so you might be able to put out embers if they do get in and then knowing to get out as soon as it's safe to do so. Uh, and you would go out the lee side of the building, that is the side that has a fire front has passed over and is heading away from the building. You go out the other side of the building. And that way you are at least not going to, uh, to get burnt. And, of course, what you're wearing when you go outside mm -hmm. is critically important. Uh, you need to protect yourself from the heat, uh, have flame-retardant clothing and a mask. Uh, we've all got plenty of masks now to help you to be able to breathe. <coughs> All right. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, does Karingai have um, a list of places that people can go to if there's a fire? Do you want to answer that, Sam or Angus? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So Karingai does have, I think it's about 15 neighbourhood safer places. It's not where I would recommend for anyone to... Um, go to in the event of a fire, you're still much better off leaving the area. These neighbourhood safer places are generally an open space that does not have overhanging trees. It probably won't have water or shelter. So um, in the event of a campaign fire, there will be evacuation points created for you to go to. Um, but generally the neighbourhood safer places are just somewhere that a burning tree will not fall on you. <laughs> and it's still best in your... Up, council does open up evacuation centres, as Sam said, mm. but they mm. just don't know which evacuation centre they will open up because beforehand they don't know where the fire is. Mm. So any, that, um, That's why we... Yep. Any... any um, mm. Is there any way of notifying people of where evacuation centres might be? Is it, would that come over the um, uh, Radio Sydney? Yeah, that would be broadcast yep. as part of the emergency messaging. Okay, thank you. I was on the uh, Karingai Access Committee for a couple of terms many years ago, and... Um, uh, on it was uh, Mr Gillett from the old Gillett's bus service, um, Mr Gillett, the son who took over the thing, the business. And um, uh, they, they, since then, um, oh, the logistics of, of um, relocating 
people in the aged care facilities on the other side of Taramara for me up uh, Bobbin Head Road and that area North Taramara was just monumental. Now there are twice as many facilities, some of them have expanded. And I'm wondering what council has in place to protect uh, people up there when that That's area really needs to be evacuated. Oh, Sam? I, I can um, add to this, uh, both Lady Davidson and the landing self-evacuated on uh, catastrophic fire danger rating days. They did that the day prior and the morning of. Um, in, in reality, is the responsibility of the uh, landholder or management and mm. the individual to to probably put something in place to not be around in the event of a fire. Um, clearly for those that are medically dependent, um, there's the capacity for them to shelter in place. So there would be no schools um, actually running on catastrophic days and a lot of preschools will actually not open on a catastrophic day if they're in a flame zone or ember zone. Mm. And the logistics of having to evacuate, which has happened uh, decades ago, uh, that area um, was just monumental back in those times mm. because people have to be who are bed, you know, bedridden and that sort of thing have to be taken to certain places. And um, I just yeah. wonder if this, I just think there should be a written plan overall. Oh, there is. Don't worry. Things have changed yeah. quite oh, a lot. In fact, it's the Department of Health that's in charge yep. of evacuating nursing homes and hospitals. Mm -hmm. And they have prearranged long before where those people will be taken and how they will be taken. Yep. Mm -hmm. And more than likely, if it's catastrophic fire, they'll be preemptively removing people yep. from those facilities uh, way before there's any fire. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so those people in the nursing homes then are covered. What about, I mean, the government's encouraging us all to live in our own places and get services. What about people who are infirm, mobility impaired and that, who are still getting services brought in for them? Is there, is there, does that just depend on whether you're in Hewan Park or wherever you are? on the people managing that, it seems that they're vulnerable. Yeah, we've done a couple of workshops with the uh, big parks, the Hewan Park yep. being one of them. The landings. The landings. And they are um, uh, self-organised to, to yep. people themselves who have the transport and the means um, to get out. And those people who don't have the means liaising with those resources and those people who do. So it's mm. all about them self-organising and getting basically what you would do in your own household, um, organised for, you know, they're separated into to a little village, um, to many precincts throughout sure. the whole thing, uh, and they're working together to, to go out. So that's what we've been uh, doing with the retirement villages. Oh, yes. Sir. A lot of the larger, larger centres actually have bushfire evacuation plans as well, which we have spoken with them about, um, particularly before the 2019 2020 season. And for those that on that catastrophic day, I think um, it was probably 85 to 90 percent of all residents at the landings, for example, did self evacuate the day prior. And there was a clear evacuation point, which was a sheltered um, building within that retirement complex that um, had sufficient water and firefighting protection in the event of an oncoming fire. Mm. That's good. All right. Any other questions? I guess um, a big wake-up call to me was a couple of years ago, one springtime, they held um, the um, uh, Rural Fire Service held um, um, a fire awareness thing over at Taramurra Public School and um, yep. one evening. And um, 
Mm -hmm. What I don't live very far from Roaf Park Mimosa Oval, and uh, the the um, big realization for for a lot of us was the fact that they said don't go to the oval because it's it's too small and the air from a bushfire will just be sucked out. And in those Victorian fires some years ago, that's what happened to whole villages. People went to their place, or oh, some, some, I don't know, somebody mentioned the town anyway, and the fires actually burn the oxygen out of the air. Sam or Angus? Can I ask, oh, sorry. Oh, Lynn, sorry. Angus? When you finish that question, can I ask, what I don't know what I need to take with me in emergency. That's what got me this last time. Yeah. I panicked. Okay. You should have seen well, what we'll, I look. Oh we'll my just goodness. go back to the oxygen question and then we'll look at your yep. question. Yeah. So that's a good that's a great question. Um I think I'll have to go back to so when we talk about neighborhood safer places, uh, they generally are these large ovals um with minimal facilities um, mm. and in terms of those mm. those ovals um, obviously uh, sh sheltering in place is your if, if you are stuck in that situation where it is too late to leave sheltering in place is your best is your best chance um, mm. however if you're if your house um, like Jenny was saying once that fire front has has passed your house may not be suitable um, those ovals may be your best chance, um, mm. really only in terms mm. of the fact that the grass may not be cured. It may be maybe well maintained and watered, yep. uh, depending on depending on the day. Um, and in terms of that, uh, the more specific point with the with the oxygen, um, if the oxygen is getting um, dangerously low in terms of uh, the oval, uh, you can imagine similarly in. Um, in a household or, or nearby um, nearby areas, it would be uh, a similar situation. Mm -hmm. So there okay, is limited. I can, I can add to that, Angus. Um, I spent uh, some time down at Marysville after Black Saturday oh. and spoke to the people who sheltered on the Oval. And they said, it's not the lack of oxygen, it's the heat. The, heat, the air yeah. is so hot that it makes it really hard to breathe. Yep. So if you're outside, you're not going to run out of oxygen, but that doesn't mean you can breathe. So the smoke's no good either. No, the smoke is definitely a negative. <laughs> so between the heat and the smoke, the oxygen content of the air is the last thing you're going to need to worry about. Yeah. Okay? The heat and the smoke are going to get you long before the oxygen depletes. Mm. So those masks are what you really want. They don't start. do a lot for heat, but they do a lot for smoke. Mm. Which masks do you recommend the best for smoke? Sam? I might, um, what, what I might take that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, they have different standards in terms of protection. So the majority of the masks you're seeing uh, during COVID times are simple surgical masks, um, and they don't actually mm. offer yeah, a rated protection for those um, bushfire particulates. Uh, the, the best protection you would get, um, generally speaking, um, for uh, a bushfire is a is one of those P2, P2 rated um, masks that filter out a certain percentage of those uh, particulates. Um, there are rated P3 masks. Um, not going to go into the specifics of the, the distinction between the two, but um, yeah. uh, generally speaking, a, a P2 rated mask will serve you um, quite well. Uh, and they are the current yeah. issue for what us as firefighters um, are issued on the fire ground. Those P2 rated um, masks that cover just the, the nose and the mouth. Right, thanks. Thank you very yes. much. So, so Lynn, just quickly, will you take you as the last question? Um, I was, I'm a celebrant, so I'm madly getting ready while all the fire brigades are going past. And I did actually hear the helicopter, but didn't, because I was trying to finish a ceremony. And 4.30, my neighbour knocked on the door and said, well, we're going. 
And I said, you're actually leaving. I, I did not believe that I would, I, I didn't know about down there because I didn't have the radio on. I'm typing crazily. Mm -hmm. So what did I, I grabbed my computer, my legal papers, what I had to wear for the next two weddings, a couple of sets of underclothes and an old T-shirt and a, I didn't take it, you know, and some painting. I mean, it was so stupid what I took. Well, not stupid, but I needed to take everything and I couldn't take yeah. everything. I panicked. Yeah. Well, that, that comes into planning. I know. Mm -hmm. So I had not done. <laughs> so we had that question Sorry, Jenny, quickly about what to take. I think that's a that's a fantastic um, lead on to what you need to take. I think you think about what um, what you will need in the in the next day, in the next twenty four hours, in the next seventy two hours, yep. um, and but particularly those those documents that are incredibly hard to replace. So yep. not only your driver's license, your Medicare card, um, but those birth certificates, yep. any any. Um, yep. Passport. Passport. Passports. Um, having those things ready to go. Insurance in a, number. In box. Insurance number. Things that will help you get back on your feet quicker um, rather than having to go through the pain of not only potentially losing your property but having to sit on the phone with the insurance company trying to find your number. Mm. What a lot of people do. So is, what I often... Is, I'm sorry. Nonsense. I was just going to say if you... Think about what you usually need to start up a bank account. Having 100 points of um, identification is usually a good start. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that all your medication scripts are in one spot, you know, whether that's a plastic box in your kitchen with a lid on it and you have all those documents in the one place so that you don't have to run around the house looking for stuff. Well, that's really it. what you want to be able to do is to access money, to be able to access relief or help and you want to be able to maintain your health. So, you know, if you can't take all your medication with you, having the scripts is a really good start. That's so, it. Um, what a few people do these days is they either um, scan important documents and put them on a little flash drive to take with them uh, or other people have been saving them to the cloud because they can access them mm. from any location. So there's a number of different options these days to uh, not having to take everything with you at the time. Mm. So we've given you lots and lots of, of bad news and some useful <laughs> tips. Yes, so James yes, yes. is going to end Thank on you. some good news. So, James, over to you. Thank you very much, Jenny. Uh, also, Sam and Angus for the first part of the presentation. So, I'll quickly run through uh, what council, what additional help the council can offer residents to prepare for good So, I'll quickly share my screen and take you to a program called Bushfirewise Rebates. Now, I'll have to run through this very quickly. So, um, Bushfire wise re rebates, in essence, is uh, is uh, financial help uh, council can provide residents to make their homes more resilient to bushfires. We do that by offering a residents um, who upgrade their homes via things like uh, bushfire uh, like gutter guards or um, new windows or any kinds of things that can be done around the house to improve its resilience to ember attack and bushfire. If you do that, you can get a rebate of up to 25% of the cost of doing that retrofit, up to a maximum of $1,500. And that $1,500 is broken into $500 maximum for uh, any work that requires a DA or CDC. For example, uh, if you live on bushfire prone land and you want to replace your old timber window windows with uh, bushfire rated windows, well, because you're in bushfire prone land, you might need a, uh, a, a DA, a development application, or a CTC. And to help you know, with the cost of, of doing that, uh, we can offer 50% of the application costs to a maximum of 500. And uh, with the, uh, the $1,000, you can go towards the retrofit uh, gutter guards, windows, et cetera. 
course, that's a maximum. A thousand dollars is a maximum. Um, but it, uh, but quickly we we can recover five hundred percent of the cost. So how to do that? How to get that rebate? Um, it's a two part process. So what you do is uh, come to the go to the go come to uh, the council's website and uh, search for bushfire wise. Okay, there. And they will take you to this webpage. Where I can send that link out as well. Sorry, James. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks. thanks yeah. And um, what you do, you complete your ready check, which is steps one and three of the plant wise community's ready check tool. We went through that earlier with, 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 with the spot. So you do step one, which is a mapping exercise, and step three, which is where you go through the various features of your house. And you download the PDFs of each page. Mm -hmm. So you click on that orange button at the bottom of each page. Uh, the next part is that you go to the RFS website and you download a bushfire survival plan. There's a link to that uh, page on the RFS website. You complete your, your bushfire survival plan and then you apply for pre-approval. So you do that by clicking on this first green button down here and in this section you can up you will uh you will upload those documents those um step three of the rate check tool and your bushfire survival plan and then um you also fill in some extra details the name address and the kind of work you plan on doing you, that email comes to me i'll have a look at it i'll we'll have a little chat about what you want to do and then uh if all things are good and well uh, uh you can go ahead and do that retrofit work and when it works finished, um, you, you come back to the same website and you submit your final claim for a rebate and um, submit your, your invoices and proof that the work has been completed. And then I will issue you the rebate. Now, this is a bit of a complicated process. Uh, it does take a little bit of time to do. Uh, so if you ever need any help uh, navigating this, uh, the rebate process. You can always give me a call, and I can run through it with you on Zoom, and uh, and give you any kind of assistance you you require. And um, and you can get in contact with me by the Climate Wise Community's website. Um, there is a page. If I go back to the website here, the um, Climate Wise Community website. There's a contact page. Click on that contact, and uh, you send me an email by that. Um, Otherwise, if you call up customer service, you can always ask me to put through to me. Uh, my name is James Chan, and I look after the, and I help look after the the wise rebate program. So that's a very quick a run through of the Bushfire wise rebate program. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me by phone or by email. Okay, that's done. Thank you. Okay. Does, any, does anyone have any questions uh, regarding the, the retrofit rebate before we... Yeah, no. it seems to be good. <laughs> I just need a spare 50,000 to do a few things. Unfortunately, we can't offer you 25% of 50,000. That'd be a lot of money. <laughs> but, right, keep going. Oh. But the good news, the good news about um, preparing a house for bushfires is that ember attack is the principal cause of houses being lost during a bushfire. Now, embers are easier to protect against compared with direct flame and uh, radiant heat. Radiant heat and flame, uh, they're, they're the big, that's a lot of heat applied to your house. That requires expensive windows, you know, if, if some, some houses that might mean rebuilding the whole thing altogether. Other places might be involved expensive shutters, new windows, etc. That's mm -hmm. very expensive, and that's really uh, best for houses that have the high bow rating. But the majority of houses in Karinga that, that are at risk of bushfire, it's mostly the embers that you need to worry about, and they mm -hmm. are and protecting against embers are one of the cheapest things you can do, and easiest things to do. So it could be as simple as gutter guards, it could be uh, nets, cheap net, metal net on the uh, vents, weep holes around the house blocking your chimneys, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you also just general tidying up around your house and then to maintain your landscaping. 
can go a long way to minimizing your risk. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you, so you don't necessarily have to spend a fortune if you don't live in the high risk bow ratings. And again, um, our mm -hmm. uh, anchors could probably feel, uh, could talk more to that point. Um, but uh, anyway, it's already 12 o'clock. So in the interest of, uh, of, of <laughs> waiting to lunch, I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking now. Okay. Where do you get the metal nets? metal mesh to go over the old-fashioned fence? So, uh, the old-fashioned fence? Uh, well, no, any, the old-fashioned fence. Metal, any aluminium or stainless steel mesh with an aperture of mm -hmm. two millimeters? How many? Yep. Two millimeters. How many mil How many millimeters? Yeah, aluminium mesh or stainless steel mesh or bronze mesh with a uh, aperture of two millimeters is good to it, is, it will be effective mm. at getting out does that there. mean four square millimeters like two by two no uh, it's a maximum a diagonal will be i think i would assume it's diagonally measured mm. it's, mm -hmm. it's i think it is just two by two yeah just I, two also, two. I also found out that my fly screens on all my windows have, yep. are plastic mesh so they would yep. Just melt beautifully, wouldn't it? Yes. So that's, yes. that's another one of my little things on my list. Well, the benefits of using and shatter uh, your glass and is then that they might. Your... Um, if, money is, if, 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 if money is available, uh, I think the crim safe screens on windows and doors. Oh, they're fantastic. They're fantastic uh, because they are very, they also protect, I think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, Sam and Angus, uh, they might also protect the windows mm. from being broken yep. as well. Yeah, uh, because yeah. during bushfire, mm. high winds can damage yep. your windows and doors, yep. and a broken window will let in embers into the house and set fire to curtains. It won't come through. The <laughs> embers won't come through that crim safe wire. No, um, not if it's two millimeters in di in space. Okay, that's that's a sense. <laughs> yep. I better do a lot of weddings to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> if I can see anybody, if anybody's allowed to see me. <laughs> oh, actually, so, I, might, I might make a quick note, a uh, quick comment. A lot of the things you can do around your house, such as uh, screens yep. on your windows mm -hmm. and doors, can have other benefits at shading your windows and doors from uh, sunlight. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have westly facing windows, those um, that metal screens on the windows can help shade your windows and limit the amount of, uh, or, or reduce the amount of light coming into your house. And during a, a heat wave, that can have benefits in terms of keeping your house cool. Oh. Yeah. And if you want to go one step further and put uh, shutters on your windows, and now bushfire rated shutters are different to standard shutters, so that's something to bear in mind. Yeah. But in generally speaking, if you, if, if, if you don't have to install bushfire shutters, your standard shutters will keep embers out, protect your windows, and keep, help keep your house cool. So you can deal with two extreme weather events in one. So we did a presentation. Uh, again, I'll share you my screen. I think uh, we did a presentation about the co-benefits of protecting from, from bushfires that, um, and that also have co-benefits for storms and heat waves. Uh, that's on the council's web YouTube channel. And, uh, and I did that presentation. Uh, and uh, that, that presentation helps clarify uh, where what actions you can take to get the maximum benefit. Because like Jenny said, uh, heat waves kill a lot more people than bushfire storms um, and floods combined. And so if you can do one action that prevents, that can help you from uh, bushfires, then you can also do something that can help you get storms uh, and heat waves. And then you're, you're much better protected all around. And some of, the, some of these actions actually help you save money on air conditioning costs. Mm. So, so, so while it might seem expensive to begin with, you might see benefits in, in the long term. Um, Adam, after the um, bushfire talk, I went to over at um, uh, um, wow. Tarama Public School. The um, uh, I got shutters put on my house, and it also assists for keeping the house warmer in winter. Mm. Mm. My, my electricity bills are lower. Mm. Yes, 
<laughs> like at night time, you, 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 you close that, that neck down, or that, the screen down, and the heat stops being radiated back out. And the windows can kind of account for up to, I think, 40% of the heat loss and heat gain. Right. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, yeah. And so if you can minimize uh, heat loss and heat gain, well, then you're saving a lot more money on, uh, on heating and cooling. And, and you can trap fire, the wall. And, and conversely, during uh, during a heat wave, if um, if the power goes out due to a black uh, due to extreme heat, um, and you lose power for your air conditioning, you might find yourself uh, being able to uh, protect yourself from extreme heat um, uh, with the shutters and whatnot. It can be a good, very clever move because some people rely on air conditioning as the only way to stay cool. And if that doesn't work, well, then you're in a tough spot. Thank you all very much. It's been very beneficial. Yeah. Okay, I think we're thank you, thank you yeah. so much. I'm not sure if I should now okay, do you. something about it. <laughs> very clearly and excellently presented, Jenny. Yes, fabulous. Thank oh, you. Perfect. Uh, great. Oh, how how do I get into that? list that you showed me how do i get into that what's the website or i, I can send that out actually i'll just send oh, that out to everybody i think fabulous fabulous because i need to actually do the plan do some yeah. homework <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> and, and, thank and, you thank you thank you and the website has well. many ways of getting in contact with us so by all means um give us a call we'll be happy to help yeah, yeah. okay Okay. Keep safe. Right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks so much. Yeah. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.